the thing that attracted me to the to the project was the um, the the kind of Russian doll like smuggling of stories within stories within stories, you know, and that 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 you can have a horror film that lives inside a thriller that lives inside a a, a romance movie, and these aren't contradictions, you know, they they kind of and they're all enjoyable in their own ways, and you you kind of move through that that during the experience of of the movie. And what I really liked about the uh, liked about the script and the book was that that. De Maurier had, had a scheme, you know, which was to smuggle in something quite sinister inside the wrapping of something um, that, uh, on the first um, on the first look, looks like a romantic story, you know. And so I can imagine her kind of chuckling as she's writing this thing, going, "People are going to think that it's about a woman who falls in love with this guy and like their incredible life, but what it actually is going to be is something really dark and, and disturbing." In terms of the genres, I, you know, I think. Uh, I, from a from a bird's eye view, you've got a kind of a basic um, romance story, and then you've got almost like a, um, uh, a supernatural haunting story, and then you've got a thriller, um, and then it kind of moves through those moments. And that's what's so clever, I think, about the Morier stuff in general, of like this idea of like haunting and um, ghosts with no ghosts. You know, there's not really any ghosts, but there are ghosts. But it's more like psychological ghosts inside people's minds, or or even, or, or more specifically, a ghost that's concocted from very little evidence um, inside the second Mrs. De Winter's mind, and she and, and and how she deals with that, and the absence of someone that becomes constructed into someone that then kind of somehow menaces her, and she's she's kind of um, uh, trying to um, compete with someone who doesn't exist. I think this book still. Um, resonates with audiences because it, uh, because of the games that De Maurier plays with with your um, uh, with your heart, you know, as as you watch it, you you you're dragged in one direction, then thrown in another, and thrown in another, and it's like it's. I feel like that sometimes you in in, in modern kind of um, storytelling, you, people are a bit mean with story. You know, they don't give you much story. It's like they 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 they, they spread it out really thin, like gruel. Um, but De Maurier's got tons of it, and, there, and there's tons and tons of story in this, and, it, and, and tons of emotion. And one of the things that attracted me to this script was like the idea that um, it's kind of, in, in one sense, it's, um, it's harking back and it's uh, to an older um, style of Hollywood, but, but in another way, it's ultra modern because it's it kind of is unashamed in its emotion in a way that a lot of movies now and a lot of storytelling falls back on on um, being slightly cynical um, and hiding and hiding emotion and being worried about it and in a way um, I, and I think at the heart of entertainment is that thing of of um, of getting to grips with characters that are full of emotion and, and, and then how you interact with that emotion and that's what what made those movies so brilliant in the first place you know and um, and I wanted to I wanted to play in that field, you know, and have a uh, and, and, and experience what that was like to, to make a movie like that. I wanted the audiences to fall in love with the characters and to invest in them fully so they, they just felt that they were there with them and they, they wanted them to succeed as a, as a, as a couple. Um, so it's got those kind of elements of Prince Charming and Rags to Riches and, you know, and she's plucked from... Um, a, a, a kind of from obscurity and brought up and all those kinds of things that happen in the romance movies but then I wanted the audience then to feel the f to feel worried for them and afraid for them and and, and terrified as as these uh, uh, as the more kind of um, uh, the more sinister things that de Maurier had, had stacked within the in the in the book happen you know and I think that's the that's the thing I always want from a film is like um you know is that journey of like of, of coming out the other side and going God, geez, I can't even remember the beginning of the film. I've, I've seen, I've, you know, I've been through so much. There was an idea that Maxim's golden suit, he was like a kind of, almost like a prize. Um, so at the beginning, he's like this great golden thing that she's getting hold of. But then as she develops, she becomes that thing herself. So then she has this golden suit that she wears at the end. So you get this kind of book ending of, of colour coding of the characters as he diminishes, then she, she rises. This is the third film I've, I've um, made with Clint Mansell, um, composing the score, and um, and we've got a really good relationship, me and Clint. And um, but what I wanted for this movie was um, 
I wanted a big score, like a big, like a lot of underscore and a lot of punctuation with music underneath the uh, uh, underneath the emotions. So you know, I was got a kind of. Um, it was a bit like kind of getting him ready for a big prize fight. You know, he's kind of, he, he's got to do a, you know, I was going to him, this this is going to be huge. It's going to be like, it's three albums worth of, it's going to be a triple disc set, this this soundtrack. It's like, you know, um, and psyching him up to it because it's a ton of music. I think it's like 90 minutes across the whole, the whole thing. And, you know, and, it, and it's just fantastic. The second Mrs. is the winter role is very difficult. You know, it's a very skilled role. It, it has, she's, got to play um there's a lot of fear and a lot of paranoia but she's not but that can edge into being you know onto the other side of that which is like annoying you know or kind of um uh too needy so she's trying to, to play the strength across the whole thing is, is 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 a very difficult thing you know and also because of and then she's in the situation of having to do it in all loads of different locations all over the place so the actual schedule of the whole thing is all split up so it's like to to, to track that role across all that all those different days is very very difficult and they needed someone with the the the, the kind of range and strength of lily james to do that army i've worked with before um on a film called free fire so um i knew him I, you know i had a more of a personal connection to him because i knew him knew him pretty well um, and the thing with Army is like, he's, you know, the, the, the whole kind of bit performance side of it, again, it's like a given that he's like a really great actor, but he's also, he's a kind of odd throwback to a kind of um, 1940s, 1950s kind of heartthrob, I think. The second Mrs. De Winter sees the, um, the Danvers as a, a surrogate for Rebecca and, like, and as I was saying, like the protector of, the, of Rebecca's um, the legacy of Rebecca and the idea of of Maxim's old life, um, and she sees that, and, and and subsequently she sees Danvers as a as a thing that's stopping her moving forward to to her own happiness. They've had their romance in France, and they return back to the ha to Mandalay, which is his country house, and you think it kind of that should be the end of the film really that should be like they've you know she they've got married it's been brilliant and then they go back to the house but the house is basically the kind of memory millstone around maxim's neck it's like all the all the negative things that have happened to him and but they're all completely unexplained as well so she gets there and something bad's happened something is putting him in a mood something's off about the whole house but no one will tell her what it is she doesn't have a name, which is part of the whole thing, which is interesting in, in itself, I think. But she, um, and when we, met, when we first meet her in Monte Carlo, she's a, um, a lady's maid to um, uh, Mrs. Van Hopper. So she's basically a kind of paid friend who kind of goes around and sorts things out. She's, she's not quite as lowly as um, uh, a maid or a, a cleaner or something, but she's kind of just a little bit further up so she's totally at the whim of this this um this woman who pays her so she has to be um on her best behavior the whole time and kind of um and agree with everything and be very subservient so but she's i think that her character is like someone who's who can um who's just at the beginning of their life and can just see wants has dreams that she wants to fulfill but she doesn't quite know how to do it and we're certainly within the stratified kind of um uh class culture of the 30s is very difficult, would be very difficult to get out from underneath that. Maxim de Winter is a, um, a kind of uh, British aristocrat slash international playboy. Um, and he's uh, a, a guy who's like um, the, the current generation of a long line of people who have been moneyed and had loads of, you know, had a big house in, in, in the UK. And, um, and he's lived a charmed life really you know um and at the moment he's he's in ho on holiday or hiding in hiding should i say in france after his wife has died and he's uh, the, the gossip on the on the croisette is that he's um you know that, that he's heartbroken and destroyed by his, his beloved rebecca dying and he's trying to you know find solace in kind of um uh in in the sun and sand of of the south of france Mrs. Danvers is the housekeeper, um, and she was um, sort of, uh, if you're to believe her, she was um, Rebecca's best friend as well. Um, and when um, the second Mrs. De Winter turns up at Mandalay, she's 
slightly frosty to her and kind of um and I imagine that because Maxim's been away for you know a year or so uh Mrs Danvers has been running the house and kind of um and who knows what they've been get everybody's been getting up to while while the boss is away kind of thing so she and and she for me is the keeper of the memory of Rebecca and she's the one who keeps that, that the idea of her alive my hopes and dreams for the release of Rebecca obviously um you know uh I'd like it to um, entertain as many people as possible, and to get, and one of, and one of the great things about the net about going out on Netflix is it'll be seen by a lot of people, and that's you know um, it, it's one of the as much as I like making indie movies, I'll you know the 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 making of stuff to be seen by people is the whole point, you know, and to get out to as many people as possible, and I think this is probably the way of getting to the most people. Um, especially as everyone's imprisoned in their houses at the moment. They have no choice but to watch this film. <laughs> the potential to go on holiday from your couch to the south of France in the 30s and experience a load of, uh, of joyous romance and hang out in some amazing houses, um, but then also have your heart ra raised through thriller and, and kind of um, and, and a bit of spookiness, and then for it all to come good at the end, I think that's the, um, the hope.